Okay. Okay, this works. Can people hear me okay? Yeah? Um, I see some people. Oh my God, are y'all here to see me read? Um, I love you all. This is so exciting. Um, okay, so I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is Dennis Norris II, um, and I am a reader and a writer and a former figure skater, and um, and I was lucky enough to have a story published in um, the current issue of McSweeney's, which is the queer fiction issue, issue 62. Um, this is part of the official launch party. We're doing it all virtually, and it's a series of... Um, readings happening on Instagram Live. And tomorrow's reader is going to be the amazing Eileen Miles. Um, it'll be right here in the same place, McSweeney's Instagram um, at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, Eileen is spectacular and the work she's, the work they're sharing is gonna be amazing. Um, so yeah. Uh, initially they were like, oh, you should answer questions. So if no one has any questions for me, that's perfectly fine. But if you do, just type them in and um, as we go along and I'll, um, if I can figure out how to see them, then I'll answer them at the end. Um, yeah, also you should know they're selling some, um, some, they're selling subscriptions to McSweeney's, both gifts or subscriptions and regular subscriptions for 20% off right now. Um, all you have to do is use the code um, Queer Fiction and you can get that discount. Um, and so, yeah, that's really exciting. I think that's everything. I'm gonna take a sip of wine because I like to drink. And, um, I'm gonna share some of this story. I hope you like it. It is called, I Know How This Dream Ends. One, mom is worried about me. She looks at me eyes wide and round. She pulls me close, hugging me so tight I can't breathe. I complain. She says what old teacher used to say. Sometimes a boy needs to take a deep breath and let it happen. Then she smiles, her lips stretched tight across her face, her eyes like fat water balloons, ready to burst. She brushes her hand across my chest and down my sleeve, smoothing every wrinkle. You ready? I nod. Good boys are supposed to be easy. I am 10 years old, and Mama says it's time to get baptized. I don't want to. I hate going to church but Mama says it's past time I got this over with. She stands up and puts her coffee mug in the sink. Let's hit the road. I don't mind listening when the choir sings, but then pastor starts preaching. He gets real big and loud. He says he's like the big bad wolf. He huffs and he puffs and he blows the devil down. I don't mean to roll my eyes when he says that. It just happens. Mama and I have been going to church every Sunday since school started ever since she became friends with old teacher. He doesn't go to church anymore. He doesn't even live in town anymore. And when he got run out, I thought that was the end of church for us. But nope, not for mama and not for me either. Last week at the end of service, she grabbed my hand and we, and we marched down the aisle to officially join the church family. That means we dedicate our lives to Jesus. And that means we get baptized. Mama bought me a brand new shirt and bow tie. She's been looking forward to this day all week. I usually fall asleep in church. I have this recurring dream where I'm lost in the woods in winter. I'm surrounded by tree trunks and snow as far as the eye can see. Night has fallen. There's a sliver of moonlight to guide me. No squirrels, no birds, no life. Nothing but dead branches, moss, and rotting brown leaves poking through the snow. I take small steps careful not to break any twigs. I hold my arms out, palms open, intercepting tree trunks, bark scratching my hands, moss soothing the skin around my scrapes. I'll never know if I am saved because mama pinches my arm when she catches me dozing. She hisses in my ear, telling me to wake up. I hate the way she sounds when she does that, like a snake slithering under my feet. 
I am cold when I wake up from that dream. And sometimes I think maybe baptism is mama's way of saving me. She says she's doing the best she can with me and that this is one way that I can help her out. This is how it works. At some point during the service, pastor will bring all the people who are getting baptized to the waiting pool in front of the sanctuary. It's all the way past the pulpit where pastor and the other ministers sit during the service and past the piano and the organ and the drums and even past the section where the choir sings. To get there, you walk to the front of the church, go through a door on the left, turn right and take the stairs. The stairwell is wooden and very narrow. It's dark and there are no windows. Any light that makes it into that stairwell comes from the top, where it opens onto the waiting pool that sits behind the pulpit against the wall, elevated as though resting at the top of the hill. Above it hang fluorescent lights and a giant wooden cross that extends almost to the ceiling. Pastor will stand inside and guide us, one by one, into the pool. Most of the time, I don't want to be baptized and I never want to go to church. But Mama says I need to be covered in the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb being Jesus. She says it's the only way to know you're truly safe because it means God is protecting you. I don't know if I believe all that, but I do know that I'm not going to convince Mama to let it go. This morning she woke me up extra early because our car broke down and we had to walk. Mama says she hasn't had time to get it fixed, but I know the truth, even though she won't admit it. She doesn't have enough money to get the car fixed. She never has enough money. We walk down the driveway past the car and turn right onto the sidewalk. A few doors down, we see Jeremy and his Nana locking their front door. I watch them as they turn around and start walking to their car. When Jeremy sees me, he stares hard and stops, his mouth bending down into an ugly frown. His Nana looks at Mama, puts her arm around Jeremy, and opens the car door. He climbs inside. They are going to church too, but it's no use asking. They won't give us a ride in any way. They go to the white church on the other side of town. Come on, Mama says, forget about that boy. She points my head forward and together we walk, her arms still tight around my shoulders. We walk several blocks in silence. I'm looking at the sidewalk, trying not to step on any cracks. Mama warns me that we'd better walk faster or we're going to be late. Then she asks me why Jeremy seems so mad at me. I shrug, even though I know the answer. I just don't know how to tell Mama. She's been through enough. I start to grab her hand, but then I realize we're passing Mimi Kennedy's house. Her family walks to church every Sunday because they live in the nice part of town, only two blocks from the building. In the grass of their front yard, I can see the shadow of the cross that hangs off the side of the church. It reminds me of the wooden balance beam on the playground that I use every day during recess. I do jumps, turns, cartwheels. I land perfectly every time, and I throw my arms over my head like the girls on TV. I stop walking on the sidewalk and start tracing the edge of the cross shadow in the grass with my toe, which I'm pointing inside my shoe. I'm about to do a leap when Mama grabs my arm and yanks me back onto the sidewalk. Enough of that, she says. We don't want you messing up the Kennedy's lawn. You've pissed them off enough. Let's go. A few days ago, there was an incident. Mimi Kennedy, who thinks she owns everything, was hogging the swings on the playground. The swings are really popular, so Principal created a rule. You have until 100 Mississippis to swing, and then you have to jump off and let the next person in line have a go but you can get back in line as many times as you want until recess is over. Mimi Kennedy wanted to swing real bad, so she pretended like she had forgotten how to count to 100. I was next in line. I tried to wait patiently, but after another minute or two, I told her that her time was up. She ignored me, so I pushed her off the swings real hard, and she fell, landed in the wood chips, and skinned her knee. Jeremy was the first one by her side, but all the other boys followed right after, along with new teacher. Everyone likes Mimi Kennedy because she's light-skinned and she has good hair. Mama says I'm pretty too, too pretty for a boy. She says the other boys are scared of how pretty I am and how soft. She says sometimes she is too. Mimi Kennedy doesn't realize how good she has it. A few years back, her daddy built a swing set in their backyard. We have a backyard too, but it's empty. Nothing but prickly brown grass, 
Mama doesn't water it enough. When I play in the backyard, I can hear it crunching under my feet. Jeremy used to say the crunching sound was actually the grass screaming, but I'm not so sure. Old teacher was at our house once, and he said brown grass is dead grass, and I said, how can dead grass scream? Mimi Kennedy's backyard is full of soft green grass, just like her front yard. Her own daddy, her own swing set, her own green grass. She has everything. That's why I got so angry when she kept swinging. It was my turn. I watched as she pumped her legs, kicking and tucking, going higher and higher, and it felt like a volcano erupted inside me, the molten lava-like energy coursing through me. Mimi Kennedy is always taking something away from me, and for once, I stopped it. I figured out how to be my own hero. Mama says that's how you know you're becoming a man. I used to think old teacher might be my way out of the woods. He had a way about him, as Mama used to say. He could calm anyone with the slightest touch. Right before Thanksgiving, there was a fire in the school. It wasn't huge, but it was close to our classroom. He lined us up and walked us to our fire exit and out of the building. He chose me to lead the line. At one point, I felt him staring at me, and I knew he could see how scared I was. He walked next to me for a few minutes, his big hand on my back between my shoulder blades. Once everyone in the class was outside, he kneeled next to me and put his arm around my shoulders. He was so close that his beard tickled my ear. He pointed near the wooden ship at the far edge of the playground. That was our fire safety spot. I had to lead the class to that spot while he stayed behind. He was so warm I felt like I was cocooned in a thick blanket that had just come out of the dryer. I had been trembling, but I stopped. I led the entire class that day, walking carefully and in a straight line. I was prepared to quiet everyone, but there was no need. When we reached the ship, I stood hugging the main mast. I thought the other kids could hear my heart thumping hard against the wood. We watched as the fire truck arrived and the firefighters jumped down and started unraveling their hose. Jeremy stood next to me, the hair on his arm brushing against mine. I looked for old teacher and when I saw him, I saluted him. I pretended I was a sailor at sea with a hat made special for collecting my broken pieces. There was nobody but me and Jeremy on that boat, not even old teacher and not even mama, who keeps saying she can be my best friend now that Jeremy doesn't let, like me anymore. When we arrive at church, we shuffle into the building. We used to slip in easy, but ever since old teacher left, people look at us and whisper, good morning, saints, mama always says. That gets her a few how are you's and sympathetic handshakes, but all the old women love me. They give me hugs and offer me candy. The mama makes me wait until after service to eat it. She doesn't want me crinkling wrappers during communion. Today, we hurry to our usual seats near the back of the sanctuary. Pastor is preaching a three-part series called The Three L's of Life, Love, Lies, and Loss. I don't usually pay much attention to his sermons, but this sounded like a mini-series I'd watch with Mama on a Saturday night. Two weeks ago was love, and last week was lies. During love, Pastor told us we have a responsibility to tell people we love them, even when it's obvious, and especially when it's not. He admitted it can be confusing to know if you really love someone, but he said he knows how to make it simple. He said, you know you love someone when seeing them makes you the happiest you ever are, even if you don't get to talk or touch, even if they're angry with you. And this made a lot of sense to me because sometimes I'm angry with mama, but I still love her so much it hurts. I kept thinking about love two Sundays ago and all through school that Monday. I thought about Jeremy and how he was my best friend. I thought about how we watched Are You Afraid of the Dark at his house and the way he put his arm around me during scary parts or how his leg would press against mine in the back seat when his mama drove us to McDonald's. I thought about how I was always happy to see him at school, even though he pretended we didn't know each other. I realized I love him. Jeremy is the person I love. That night he came over. We went to my room and started watching TV. He wanted to watch something called the Stanley Cup. It was boring but he leaned back and put his arm out, wanting me to cuddle next to him and lay my head on his chest. Just like we saw couples do on TV when we used to play at his house and his Nana was watching her soap operas. Jeremy had a can of Pepsi in his other hand and he kept pointing it at the TV and explaining the rules of hockey to me. I pretended to care about what he was saying. I kept nodding and asking questions, but all I could think about was my responsibility. It began to feel like something heavy, 
like a thing I shouldn't share. After a while, I got quiet. I played with a loose thread on my t-shirt, and then I started crying. I'm not ashamed to cry in front of him, not like I am with the other boys. Even though it felt hard to breathe, and even though I sat up and then Jeremy sat up and interlaced his fingers with mine, like he sometimes used to do when we walked to school together and no one was looking. I knew I couldn't tell him what I'd realized in church the day before. I knew I'd figured out something that is the worst kind of secret. So I stayed there, curled up in my bed, crying into my knees. For a few minutes, Jeremy held me. He rubbed my back, leaned in close, and said, it's over. He can't hurt you anymore. He's gone. And even though I wasn't crying because of old teacher, I nodded. I cried harder and louder until Jeremy pressed his forehead against mine. He lifted my chin in his hand, cradling my jaw in his fingers. And then he kissed me. His lips were soft and still, and I felt small and safe. This is why I love Jeremy. When I calmed down, he stood up. He put his shoes on and left. I didn't know what his leaving meant until the next day after school, when he and a bunch of boys, when he had a bunch of boys over to his house to play basketball. Now he spends all his time with them and with his girlfriend, Mimi Kennedy. And that's the problem with girls like her. They steal everything from boys like me. I'll stop there. Um, thank you guys for um, staying and listening and paying attention. Um, I'm gonna see if there were any questions and if so, I will answer them. Um, but this can be super quick. I see lots of hearts and lots of familiar faces. Thank you. I'm just gonna scroll through um, really quick. Let's see, I see one. What is your relationship to religion? Um, that is a great question. So I'll start with answering that one. Um, my relationship to religion is hella complicated. Um, I was raised in a very religious family. My father was a minister. Um, he was actually sort of like a bishop in um, in um, the the Baptist church. And um, I not only was I a member of a church that we went to every week, but my father was over like 40 churches. So we went to a bunch of different churches like every Sunday. And so it was interesting because I was like, very involved in the faith and, and sort of very visible because um, my dad had a very visible job in a national organization. Um, but I also like wasn't super deeply involved in my church in the way that like my, my siblings were back when my dad was a pastor. So I have this very fraught relationship with religion um, and my queer identity has a lot to do with that. The ways that humans and humanity have um, manipulated religion for so many different agendas has a lot to do with my very complicated and fraught relationship with religion. Um, and I don't consider myself a religious person, but I ended up going to a Quaker college and um, I learned a fair amount about Quakerism in that time. And that, that practice um, meant a lot to me and still means a lot to me. And so I would call myself Quaker if I called myself anything at all. Um, and I think I have a lot of respect for religion um, because it, it is what I was raised on. And I also think that I, I recognize that there are a, religious ideas um, or methods of thinking that are like ingrained in me because this is what I grew up in. So like when I think about being a writer, I think about this as like my purpose, that I have a purpose in life. And I think there's something inherent to that thinking, to the idea that then that means that on some level, I think there may be some being that like, gave me that purpose, gave me that gift, gave me that intention. Um, and so I think that on a certain level, these things, whether it's religion or other things that are really complex and really try to get at the, the core of who we are as human beings, um, that these things are, are just ingrained in us in ways that we really don't even understand all the time. 
and um, it's definitely a thing that deeply impacts my writing and the way the way that I think about work, the way that I think about my life, and almost all of my work is dealing with um, religion in some way, shape, or form. So that will probably continue for quite some time as I um, as I begin to to work on other projects as well and, and things that, that are that hopefully will come out more in the future. Um, religious questions are always at the heart of them. So yeah, okay. I don't see any other questions, so I think um, that is probably enough. So um, thank you guys for being a part of this. It was super fun to share some of that work. Um, you can read, that was about half of the story and you can read the rest of it again in issue 62, the queer fiction issue of McSweeney's. Um, and again, it's, they are selling um, gift subscriptions and regular subscriptions for 20% off. Um, the code is queer fiction. I believe that once um, it, it'll be like another, a slide in their story. So just watch out for that. And again, this is part of the um, official launch party for issue 62 and tomorrow they will be featuring the um, extraordinary Eileen Miles. Um, so yeah, check out Eileen. It's, it's going to be fabulous. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And go and enjoy your nights.